This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's webinar is Preventing Back Pain During Common Daily Activities. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain anonymous as usual. Today's presenters are Dr. David Ben-Eliyahu, Caitlin Conville, and Lisa Marie Puglisi. Dr. Ben-Eliyahu is the Administrative Director of the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather Hospital and Director of the Mather Chiropractic Collaboration Program. He has advanced certifications in sports injuries and pain management. Dr. Ben Eliyahu has been in private practice in Selden, New York for 34 years, where he directs an integrated and collaborative spine and musculoskeletal practice. Caitlin Conville is a nurse practitioner and program coordinator for the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather. She received her Master's of Science from Stony Brook University after completing their family nurse practitioner program. She joined the Back and Neck Pain Center from the inpatient side of Mather Hospital, where she worked in orthopedics for over four years. Lisa Marie Puglisi received her master's and doctorate degree from Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. She has been a physical therapist at Mather Hospital for over nine years. Dr. Ben, you want to go ahead and get us started? Oh, you just need to unmute, Dr. Ben. Got it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending. Today's uh, webinar is going to be on preventing back pain from common daily activities. We'll cover things that uh, we need to change that contribute to people getting back pain, and we'll discuss um, these things from the perspective of everyday life, a physical therapy perspective, exercise perspective, and then we'll take any questions you may have. So back pain tends to be the number one source of chronic pain in the United States. 85% um, of most people in the United States will experience back pain at one time or another in their lives. 10% uh, of all Americans at this very moment are experiencing back pain. And low back pain is the leading cause of global disability throughout the world. Um, that's a pretty big factor. Uh, Americans spend, and this number is actually uh, wrong, it's approaching about $100 billion a year on back pain treatments. And that number is pretty high considering it's such a prevalent problem in society. So there's got to be a better way of doing things. There's got to be a better way of preventing things. And we're going to try and cover some of those things today. One of the most important factors with back pain, if you look on the far right, it talks about recurrence. You know, why does my back keep going out? Well, there's lots of factors that contribute to that. But the data shows that back pain actually can recur as much as 50% of the time within a year, and as much as 60 to 80% of the time within two years. Why does that happen? It happens because we didn't change something, something that's causing our problem. And it can range from postural to weight, to the way we eat, lack of exercise, whether we smoke. Um, there's a host of different risk factors that if we don't identify them and manage them correctly, it's going to actually contribute to perpetual pain and recurrence of pain. So we're going to focus today on everyday activities, and these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today um, that can actually harm your back. Lifting heavy objects improperly, bending, uh, improper lifting technique, prolonged sitting. Sitting is actually the new smoking today. Uh, we tend to sit a lot, especially during this pandemic. We've been sitting a lot at our computers. Lack of activity and exercise, uh, carrying a heavy bag or a purse on one shoulder, poor posture, flat feet. Uh, constantly sitting on a couch and slouching or sitting in our beds and reading and watching TV, a mattress that may be too soft or even too hard, uh, poor sleep posture. And these are the things that we're going to cover today. And then diet and the role of diet in preventing back pain. And then lastly, another big factor, especially in today's times, is stress and anxiety. So let's look at some of the factors for bending and lifting. Notice in this picture on the far left how that guy is bending to lift up that heavy weight. He bent forward at his back, 
And what he did was he shifted his center of gravity over his spine, and now he's trying to lift up that heavy weight. So in order to get to the erect position with that heavy weight now, he has to use his back to get erect. The problem with that is it's going to put a tremendous strain on the muscles and joints of the lower back, and that's going to cause an injury. The best way to change your lifting technique is to keep your head up, bend at your knees, take a wide athletic stance, feet shoulder length apart, and then actually bend at your knees to pick up the item and then use your legs to drive upwards. And always face the object and keeping your shoulders and your knees lined up. So notice the two differences and it's a vast difference and it definitely helps to prevent back pain. Next. So what about sitting? Well, sitting has become um, unfortunately the new smoking today, uh, especially during the pandemic when a lot of us have worked from home. We tend to sit at our computers. And unlike when we were working in the workplace, we'd get up, we'd move around, we would take breaks. At the computer at home, we tend to just sit there for a long, long time. So if you slouch at your computer and your head shifts, it can cause an actual um, shift of the joints and the muscles. And it's as if you put 20 pounds of weight on your head. That can cause your neck and your back muscles to become very, very tight. The longer you sit, the other thing that happens that's been shown in research is that the discs will actually increase the pressure. Now the discs are the pads that sit between the vertebrae and your spine. It's almost like a jelly donut or a buffer. If that disc is compressing because you're sitting too long, it increases the pressure in that disc and that can cause back pain. Muscle weakness can occur. You can cause sciatica pain from sitting too long. So notice that in that picture on the right side, we talk about three tips for preventing low back pain. Um, basically what you wanna make sure is that your upper back and lower back are nice and erect. I always tell people to put a towel, a rolled up towel or a pillow behind your lower back so that it's come from, um, supporting that lower lumbar curve. And notice that the thighs and calves are basically perpendicular to one another. That's really important. So I tell patients to actually try and take a box or a step stool and put it under your feet because that actually forces your spine to stay erect. If you're working on a computer, you wanna make sure that that monitor is where the number two is. You wanna have it in line with your eyes so that you're not putting your head down and shifting your spine forward. Those are really important things. And then lastly, you have to get up. You can't sit for hours at a time. So every 20 to 30 minutes, you need to get up, take a little break, move around, stretch a little bit, um, as you're seeing in the picture under number three, and then go ahead and go back and sit down again. So posture for sitting is really important. And if you take the steps necessary to do what we just talked about, it can actually mitigate some of those effects from prolonged sitting. Next. So what about exercise? Now the physical therapist Lisa is gonna talk about exercise and the importance of it, but along the lines of sitting in our desks all day long and not taking breaks, we tend to not stretch and exercise as much as we should. In fact, exercise is probably a critical factor of why people develop back pain, because if you're not exercising and your core is getting weak, and Lisa will go over the core, what happens is your back muscles become weak, they atrophy, they don't support your spine. So the more you exercise, the less chance of weakening your core, the more you strengthen your core, the less chance of you getting back pain. And you can do things as simple as just walking, um, exercising in a swimming pool. I mean, right now it's summertime. That's a great place to do exercises. You can use resistance bands, as you can see in the lower right-hand picture. Those people are using bands instead of weights. I actually tell people all the time to use bands because they're resistance and it's much less stress on the joints. And then lastly, stretching, simple stretching like yoga. And you can get all these resources online, but the more you stretch, the more you exercise, the more you move, the less chance you have of developing back pain. Next. So talking about core strength, here are some examples of core strength exercising. So things called the dead bug, things like um, the quadruped, like you can see in the middle. And I think Lisa's gonna talk more about this. You can do semi-sit exercises, like in that lower left-hand corner, where you're kind of seated, you get up using your legs. It helps to strengthen your lower body. Um, you can do quadruped exercises on your hands and knees, where one leg and one arm opposite each other go up. And then these are called planks, and planking helps to develop core strength and back strength. These are simple exercises that if, you don't have any orthopedic problems that would prevent you from going on your knees or going on your elbows like on the far right. These are really excellent exercises to do. Next. And by the way, these uh, this, this will be emailed to you as an attendee, so you don't have to take notes and worry about taking pictures. We're going to send you this PowerPoint by email so you can reference it. 
Another big reason for back problems is poor posture, whether it's seated posture or standing posture. So if you look at the far left picture, notice how that person's head is shifted forward a couple of inches and notice how their upper back, the red zone, has shifted also forward. So if you have a forward posture, that's going to promote upper back pain and give you spasms and tightness and pain in your upper back and even in your neck area. By simply moving your neck back, so instead of doing this, by simply coming this way, you can relieve a lot of that mechanical stress. So posture is very important. Now in the middle picture, if you look at the lower back region, that person's belly is kind of sticking out because their abdominal muscles are weak and is creating a hyperlordotic curve where their lower back curve is more accentuated than it normally should be. So that can cause a lot of lower back pain. So keeping your core strong, keeping your abdominal strong, worrying about posture as you're seated and standing are critically important. And they make special even tools. Uh, there's one that I recommend to patients called Upright. If you can't correct your own posture, it's a little device like a credit card that goes on your upper back. And if you shift like that person did in the far left picture, it actually vibrates to remind you to get into a correct posture. So it's kind of like a cognitive training. Uh, next. What about your feet? Well, this is a big factor too. So a lot of people have pronated feet or have very flat feet. And you know, people say to me, ah, everybody has that, that's not a big deal. Well, the fact is it is a big deal. If you look at the far left picture um, and you look at that person's left foot, notice how he's pronating and his foot's flat. And this is, an ex this is obviously an exaggerated picture for you to understand how it affects your posture. But notice how the arch goes in, the knee buckles in, the pelvis or the hip joints kind of drop low to the left, the spine curves, and now the shoulders are out of kilt also. This creates a postural stress syndrome that can actually cause muscles to become very tight, to knot up, and actually can cause mechanical stress to the joints of the spine and lead to back pain. By simply putting arch supports in, whether they're made by a podiatrist or you use some um, ones that you can get in the store, uh, and some are better than others. Um, you can see how that corrects that foundational posture from the foot up and corrects alignment and therefore keeps your spine balanced and prevents back pain from being perpetuated. Next. Sleep posture. We talked about standing and, and um, seated posture. So I tell patients, you know, two things you need to consider here. Mattresses, you don't want something that's too firm and, uh, and the same reason you don't want something too soft. I always tell people, find something that's medium firm that actually has enough give to it that allows your hips and shoulders to sink in if you're on your side. And then put a pillow under your head and put a pillow between your legs if you sleep on your side. And notice how that spine, head and neck are kind of like a straight line. And the same thing on the bottom picture on the left, that person's laying on their back. They have a pillow under their knees, a pillow under their head, and the spine is nice and straight. If that person were to be laying on their stomach, if you look at the far right picture, um, the spine hyperextends, you have to turn your head, and ultimately that's going to cause neck and back problems and perpetuate some if you already have back and neck problems. So you want the mattress to have a little give, but you don't want it to have too much give because if it's too soft, you'll sag, and that'll put a lot of stress on your back. And if it's too hard, your shoulders and your hips won't have any give to them and it'll create stress. Next. So I'm going to let Caitlin, our, uh, Caitlin Connell, our nurse practitioner at our program here at Mather, talk about the role of diet and some other things in back pain. Caitlin? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Conville. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the role of diet and nutrition. Um, so on the left here, we have examples of foods that are not the healthiest foods in the world, uh, foods that promote inflammation in the body and promote weight gain while providing very few nutritional benefits. Whereas on the right, you can see fresh, colorful produce, um, high antioxidants, vitamins and minerals, and these foods serve to reduce inflammation in the body. So research shows that our diet plays a significant role in inflammation and pain in the body. Um, inflammation is an important underlying mechanism for the development of chronic disease, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and cancer. Um, increased inflammation in the body is also found in patients with chronic pain. So by recognizing foods that can reduce inflammation, such as plant-based foods, as well as those that promote inflammation, we can make diet modifications that can decrease inflammation in the body and help to reduce pain. Okay, so anti-inflammatory diets. So on the left here, we have the food pyramids for both the Mediterranean diet and a whole foods plant-based diet, which are anti-inflammatory diets that provide excellent guidelines for how to make diet modifications that will reduce inflammation in the body. 
So as I said, inflammation in the body can either be positively or negatively affected by the foods that we eat. So pro-inflammatory foods or foods that increase inflammation in the body include saturated fats, um, which are found in meat, especially red meat and whole fat dairy products, um, trans fats, which are found in the hydrogenated oils that are used to make processed or packaged baked goods or crackers, um, omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in oils such as corn oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, and sunflower oil, and in sugar and sugar-laden foods. Whereas anti-inflammatory foods help to reduce inflammation markers in the body, and this includes foods high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, such as canola oil and walnuts, uh, monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil, peanut oil, nuts, and avocado, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, the more colorful, the better, and many different herbs, spices, and teas that we have listed here. Next slide. Okay, so obesity, um, BMI, and being overweight. So one thing that not everyone thinks about every day is the way in which the size of our body can increase back pain or cause pain. Um, obesity in America has become increasingly prevalent with the latest CDC, CDC statistics indicating that 42.5% of adults over the age of 20 have a BMI that categorizes them as obese, while 73.6% of adults over the age of 20 are classified as overweight, um, including those uh, classified as being in the obese category. So multiple studies have been conducted to study the relationship between back pain and increased body size. And a meta-analysis of these studies found that being overweight or obese was a significant factor in both developing and perpetuating pain. So as you can see here on the right, when our bodies are healthy weight, our systemic levels of inflammation are low. We have low levels of mechanical stress on our low back and our ground reaction force is low. As the body size increases, inflammation levels go up the extra weight we are carrying increases the mechanical stress levels on our back and our muscle strength decreases and the ground reaction force increases. And these factors just all work together to cause or worsen back pain. So now we, we all know that increased body weight can contribute to health problems, including back pain, um, but what can we do to reduce this risk factor? So as we discussed earlier, it's important not just to seek to reduce calorie intake um, and increase exercise to decrease body size, but it's important to recognize that what you eat matters. So the foods that increase inflammation in the markers in the body can contribute to pain and inflammation, while the other foods um, that are healthier can decrease inflammation in the body. So it's important to focus on the type of food that you're eating as well. Next slide. All right, so anxiety and stress. So cause and effect. So when your body experiences a stressor, okay, your sympathetic nervous system responds by releasing stress hormones. So these hormones can cause physiological changes in our body that have a negative impact on our body. So you can see here on the right some of the effects of this regular experience of stress, and this includes things like lack of concentration, low energy, headaches, increased pain, depression, a suppressed immune system, increased blood pressure and heart rate, joint pain, muscle tension, protein breakdown, decreased bone density, and a change in appetite that can lead to weight gain, among many others. So with re regard to the experience of pain, the experience of psychological stress in particular can have a negative cyclical effect on the body. So here on the left, you can see how psychological stress can lead to pain, as we discussed, which can then cause us to react to that pain with things like muscle guarding, which then restricts our range of motion, which then can lead to muscle weakness and atrophy and decreased function, which in turn can lead to more psychological distress. Next slide. So now that we know some of the ways that chronic stress negatively affects our well-being, how can we work to reduce our stress levels on a daily basis? So some of the ways that we can minimize stress include things like making a schedule. Um, so by making a, a schedule for yourself, you can evaluate what a doable schedule looks like. You can make adjustments to your activities to avoid overbooking, overstressing, and you can carve out time for yourself to rest, to decompress, and to practice self-care in between activities. Um, eating a healthy diet, as we said, very important. Um, exercising regularly as well. Uh, developing good sleep habits. So sleep loss can actually make it harder to manage things like blood sugar and stress levels. So aiming for seven to eight hours of sleep can really help to keep your blood sugar, appetite, and stress at normal levels. Um, changing your expectations. So it's, it's really easy, um, especially now with everything going on in the world, to get overwhelmed by too many activities, stressors, responsibilities, um, and trying to do it all. So Really deciding the activities that offer you the most positive impact. Um, those you can eliminate the activities that tend to weigh you down. Spend your time engaging in things that you actually enjoy and that have a positive effect on your well-being. And then breathing, meditation, and yoga. As Dr. Ben spoke about earlier, 
Um, it's really important sometimes to take out the time for things like meditation and yoga to stop and take a deep breath, give your body the oxygen that it needs, um, and to reduce levels of stress through these practices. So on the right here, we have an example of body scan meditation, which is just a little exercise that you can do to be very mindful about your body and to, to meditate and just take a pause um, from your daily stressors in life. All right, next slide. All right, so I'm going to hand you back over to Dr. Ben Eliyahu, who's just going to review some of the common reasons for back and neck pain. So we've kind of given you a few reasons and a few ways to prevent back pain from occurring, but what happens when it does occur? You know, why does it happen? What anatomical structures are getting affected? So we're kind of going to give you an education about different pain origins in your spine that can actually cause back pain. So we'll start on the far left where it says joint and arthritic conditions. So the red circles are showing the joints of the spine. Those are called facet joints. That tends to cause what we call mechanical back pain. The joints are out of alignment, they're pinched, they become arthritic, and there are little nerve endings inside those joints that can actually convey pain signals to the brain so you feel back pain and then they brain tells the muscles around it to cause the muscles to get very tight, and then it can cause muscle spasms. Another reason for mechanical back pain is the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is on both sides of your pelvis, which is the lower back area, and very commonly seen um, when someone quickly bends over to twist and turn. Uh, it's seen commonly in pregnant women, puts a lot of strain on those joints, and it's also not uncommonly seen in patients who have had previous back surgery. It tends to be underdiagnosed and it tends to be the cause of back pain 30% of the time. So what about pain down the leg? We call that sciatica. The sciatic nerve is the big nerve that starts in the lower back out of the lower lumbar spine, follows that blue trajectory all the way down the leg and can cause pain in the butt, pain in the thigh or calf, um, even numbness or tingling and even weakness. So what causes sciatica? Well, typically a disc, now, in the middle picture where it says bulging disc, you can see the jelly in the middle of that disc is kind of moved from the middle out towards that right nerve. So it pinches that nerve, and then that nerve will convey pain down the sciatic area. So you can have bulging discs, you can have herniated discs, and those discs are sticking out. And our job is to identify if that's what's causing your pain and then recommend the proper therapeutic procedure to help get rid of it so that you feel better. What about muscular pain? So another reason for sciatica is piriformis syndrome. There's a muscle you can see inside your pelvis that sits on top of the yellow nerve called the sciatic nerve. And that little left picture that's showing the sciatic nerve, you can see how that nerve can get pinched. That happens commonly in runners and athletes, people who develop disc problems, that muscle will get very tight and then it can contribute to sciatica pain, but that's actually a muscle that's doing it. So we have to work out that piriformis spasm. We teach patients how to identify it, how to stretch. And then lastly, there's something called trigger points. So the trigger points of where that like X's are in the neck area, right in the middle picture. So those muscles go into spasm, they can cause pain locally where the X is, but they can also cause pain to refer like you're seeing in the red stippled zones. So those are the most common reasons that we have to try and identify that can cause pain in your back or your neck. And then um, we wanna try and prevent by giving you some of the tips we gave you today. Next. So what do you do if you have pain in your back? Well, obviously you wanna rest for a little while, but resting too long is actually not indicated anymore. You could use ice and heat. Um, if it's not going away after a, you know, a few days or a couple of weeks, it might be time for some intervention. And we always start with the least invasive things first, like physical therapy or chiropractic medicine, acupuncture, massage therapy. Um, some things that you need to look out for are red flags. You know, if you develop a fever with your pain, you develop bowel or bladder dysfunction, numbness in your, um, your private area, motor weakness, muscle weakness, you're losing sensation or numbness, pain is just becoming so severe you just can't take it. Yeah, you should consult with a physician or come see us at the back and neck pain center and we can help uh, navigate you better. Next. So I want everybody to take a moment here to just take a look at this uh, tool that we use clinically. Um, it's called an Oswestry Disability. It's a function index. We look at people's functions. So assuming you know, you're watching this, you may have had problems with your back before, you may have experienced some functional issues because of pain. Just take a minute or so just to fill this out and then we'll refer to it at the end. I think there are about 10 questions, about nine. Um, I'll give you about 30 seconds just to kind of jot down which ones are positive for yourself, and then we'll come back to it at the end.
And if you have a pen and paper near you, just kind of jot the number down. And then when we get towards the end, I'll ask you to just put it in the Q&A section and just jot your number in, which is anonymous. And um, just so I can get an idea of what people's functional indexes are. Okay, let's move on. So we talked a little bit about physical therapy and chiropractic medicine. Here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we have um, a physical therapy department and we refer out to chiropractors. We're gonna talk a little bit about it. If you're not familiar with these things, we're just gonna talk about some of these things so that you get a better idea of how back pain, if you develop back pain and it's not going well, how it can be managed. Next. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about chiropractic care. I'm the administrative director of the Spine Center, Spine Center but I've also been a uh, practicing chiropractic physician for 38 years. So I'm gonna talk a couple of minutes about chiropractic just to give you an idea of what modern day chiropractic care is like. Chiropractors generally work on the spine and the musculoskeletal system. Uh, we don't use drugs. Um, we take a hands-on approach to diagnosing. We use imaging. We talk about evidence-based care. Um, our recommendations usually include some sort of manual medicine and rehabilitative exercise. We talk about posture and nutrition. And um, we have many chiropractors now vetted by the hospital that we refer to uh, if a patient needs to be seen by a chiropractor. Next. So some of the things that, chiro <clears throat> excuse me, that chiropractors do is spinal manipulation. That's the thing that we're most known for. However, we don't really use that a lot. I personally use something called the Cox table a lot, which is a spinal decompression table. Um, it's, much, it's much less forceful on the joints. We do a lot of myofascial and trigger point work and massage work on muscles. We use traction. We'll use instruments instead of doing the standard manipulations. Uh, we talk about exercise and I'll show you a little bit about what that Cox table looks like. Um, so here you can see the doctor's actually has his right hand on the spine. The left hand's gonna stretch the spine downwards. It goes up and down. It's almost like a pumping action. And that pumping action reduces force inside the disc and the joints. So it helps to reduce disc herniations. It helps to align joints and make joints more functional. It also most importantly um, helps to fix disc issues. Like you can see, this is actually a research study I published. You can see before treatment, you can see in that red circle on the left, the disc is sticking out into the white space. Um, that's called a herniated disc. And then after several weeks of treatment and re-imaging, if you go to the after one, you can actually see that that disc resorbed. So this type of technique um, is very, very useful in helping to prevent surgery um, and getting people better from a conservative perspective. The top right picture is the same exact treatment, but it's except it happens in the neck. So we can actually not have to use high velocity manipulations. You know, some people refer to it as cracking the neck or back. We actually use this distractional type of force. Next slide. So we're going to talk a couple of minutes about physical therapy. Uh, Lisa Puglisi is a physical therapist at our hospital. Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Um, as Dr. Ben said, I'm Lisa Puglisi from Mather's Outpatient Physical Therapy Department, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what we tell our patients um, about activities that they can do to avoid any pain. Um, so here we have um, our number one thing that we harp on the most is posture. Um, so to, just to reiterate what Dr. Ben said, that's really kind of the basis of where injuries can start. So if we get you in a good posture, that can really help to alleviate some of the discomfort. Uh, a lot of people have desk jobs or have more of a sedentary lifestyle because what's going on. So you really wanna try and make sure, especially when you're in a sitting posture that you're really sitting upright and um, you can get a lumbar roll, which tends to be very effective. You can buy them online. Or um, sometimes I also like to tell patients that they could take a towel, roll it up, and put that right at the small of their back. So that kind of helps them to maintain proper posture without um, them having to think about it. It's going to kind of block you from getting into any flexed posture. Uh, with prolonged standing, people tend to hunch forward. They get to, tend to get that forward head. So you really want to try and get upright as much as you can. Think about that plumb line, like someone's taking a string and kind of pulling you upward. So your shoulders are in line with your ears and you're keeping everything aligned. Uh, we talk a lot about bending and lifting. You really want to try and get as close to the object as possible and use the powerhouse of the body, which are the legs, keep that spine neutral, and then just come upright with, um, with the object. Um, exercising is absolutely a great thing for you to do, and it really helps to kind of keep everything loose, but you want to try and start with an active warm-up. So if you're going for a jog, you want to start with um, a light walk. 
You also could do walking lunges or squats, and that's really just to get the blood flowing before your activity. And then after your activity is when you would want to do more of those um, slower static stretches like quad stretching, hamstring stretching, um, piriformis stretching is really great to get that buttock muscle and calf stretching. And that actually will help to prevent um, injury, but it also helps to limit soreness after exercise. So should you find yourself having some pain and needing physical therapy, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do here. So when you come for the evaluation, uh, first, again, we're gonna assess your posture, really see where the deficits are there. We'll do neurological testing if you have any radiating symptoms, so symptoms that are going into the legs. We'll go through strength testing and then check your range of motion of your spine. And um, this is our clinic up here. And what separates us from other physical therapy clinics is that we use the McKenzie method. And the McKenzie method is really an exercise-based approach to assessing, diagnosing, and treating the spine. It's very effective and evidence-based when performed appropriately. And what we do is we just bring you through a lot of repeated movements and see where some movements can irritate you, and then some movements can make you feel almost a relief of pain. And once we find that, then we kind of set up a whole exercise program based off of whether one movement makes you feel better. So for example, if you felt better with extension, then that's kind of the exercises that we're gonna get you going with. Um, it really focuses on patient independence because we'll give you these exercises, and if you're really compliant with it, they can be very effective and provide immediate pain relief. Uh, we also work on postural correction um, within the McKenzie method. And the other things that we do here are um, postural stabilization, strength training. So we focus on core stability, trunk strengthening, um, and then just also working on functional strengthening. So working on squats and lunges because that's going to help you to bend and lift better. And lastly, we also do flexibility exercises. Um, actually, Emily, can you go to that next slide? Yes, the management of symptoms. So our goal really is to improve your function and centralize your symptoms. So if you are feeling symptoms into the leg, we want to do what we call centralize the symptoms, bring the symptoms back into the spine, um, with the ultimate goal being relief of pain, um, increasing your movement, your strength of your core and your legs, and increasing uh, your spine range of motion. And lastly, we want to, so you can go back, Emily, to that other one. Yeah. So we want you to be able to have the tools so that you prevent the pain from coming on again. So we'll have that specific exercise for you. In this picture, this gentleman is doing extension exercises. So if you ever start to feel any sort of discomfort with activities, you could go right back into those extension exercises, and that should help to keep it at bay. Um, we also leave you with a comprehensive home exercise program. So exercises that you've done here, physical therapy, we kind of print them out for you so that way you know what to do to continue to maintain the strength that you've gained so far here. Um, again, posture is always the biggest thing. So if you're able to maintain your posture, then that should help to minimize any sort of discomfort you have. And lastly, you wanna remain active. So now that you're feeling better, you wanna not have any sort of fear avoidance. You wanna get back to those activities. You don't have to worry about having pain. So uh, physical therapy can be a great first line of defense. All right, so this is Caitlin again, and I'm just gonna briefly tell you a little bit about the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather Hospital and how our program works. All right, so this is our step ladder approach. So this graphic depicts our approach to treatment here at the Back and Neck Pain Center. So we use what we refer to as a step ladder approach. And with this approach, we aim to provide the least invasive effective treatment option for your condition. So for most people, this means starting with conservative treatment measures such as physical therapy or chiropractic care. Now, if you've already tried conservative measures without improvement, or if your condition warrants further intervention, we may start a little bit higher on the ladder with something like interventional pain management or one of our support programs. So in cases where you have those red flag signs or symptoms or a symptom, um, any symptoms that indicate an urgent condition, we may send you directly to a surgeon. So 
Statistically, about 75% um, of our patients improve with conservative measures, but we continue to evaluate you throughout the course of treatment and recommend additional treatments or steps as appropriate. About 20% of our patients um, utilize pain management treatment options, and about 5% of our patients have required spinal surgery. So our over overall goal here is to provide the most appropriate treatment for you and treatment that will be effective in reducing your pain and will help you to regain function. Next slide. So how is the back and neck pain center different? Why choose the back and neck pain center? So here at the back and neck pain center, we provide evidence-based multidisciplinary care that's customized by a clinical team, um, including a collaborating physician and guided by myself, the nurse practitioner. So when I talk about multidisciplinary care, I'm referring to the fact that we have multiple providers from many different disciplines, including spine surgery, interventional pain management, physical therapy, and chiropractic, who all work together to coordinate your care. So we meet once weekly and review patient charts to allow for providers from different backgrounds to weigh in on the selective treatment plan and provide their unique perspectives. So at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we also aim to reduce recurrent episodes of back and neck pain in the future by teaching you about adopting a healthy lifestyle and talking about things such as diet and exercise. Uh, we also avoid the use of high-risk pain medications here. So while one of our goals is to alleviate your pain, we want to find the underlying cause of your pain and provide treatment that addresses this underlying cause. Um, here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we also identify and address disparity of care factors. So there are many factors that make it difficult for individuals to access treatment, and that, that includes things like financial obstacles, transportation issues, mobility issues, comorbid medical conditions, mental health issues, and difficulty managing multiple appointments with different providers. So at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to identify these factors and provide assistance to ensure that you're able to get the treatment that you need. Next slide. All right, so now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ben Eliyahu, who will review the results of your risk assessment with you. Okay, hi again. So that, did anybody filled out that survey? If you did that, um, just go into the Q&A section and just kind of put in your number. Um, I'll start talking about it, but just so I can get an idea. Um, basically, if you scored or checked off two or more, this functional index generally means that you're having a significant problem that um, actually is affecting your ability to function with everyday activities of living, uh, performing work or hobbies. Um, so the bottom line is insurance companies like us to measure function instead of pain now, because obviously our goal is to get you out of pain. But if you're experiencing um, a score of like three or higher, that means you have a mild to moderate at three, a mild to moderate functional disability that your pain is affecting. Anything from like five or higher means that it's a significant disability. So we aim to identify um, what the risk factors are that are perpetuating that. We aim to identify what we can do to help you functionally improve by gaining strength. And we coordinate with our providers to make sure that we fix that. So if you're having a high score, um, and it's not going away, I urge you to consider calling us at the Back and Neck Pain Center so we can help you with that. Um, as you can see, we take pretty much every insurance plan. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, um, we talked about a lot of healthy lifestyle habits and activities that can actually cause and perpetuate back pain. So some of the things that are the take home message today is get active, exercise and stretch, get your core strong. Um, if you're not eating right, consider switching to a Mediterranean style diet, um, which is anti-inflammatory nature. Lose weight if you're overweight. Um, correct your posture, whether it's seated, standing, or slip, sleeping. Um, we talked about the way to do that. Stop smoking if you're smoking. <clears throat> and manage your mental health. You know, start doing some meditation. Go to yoga. And you don't have to go out to do this. There are lots of tools and resources online. If you're having perpetual problems and you know, doing some of the things we talked about today doesn't seem to be doing it and correcting it, then, you know, don't live with this. There is help out there. You can call us here at the Spine Center. Um, recognize that sometimes you do need help. However, if you do experience any of those red flags, you know, obviously you want to see a doctor immediately. Next slide. Okay, so if you have any questions for us, you can certainly email them to us. We'll take questions now, or you can call us for at that number for an appointment or for a consult. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding anything we discussed today? Go ahead and type them in. <clears throat> if not, then we'll, uh, we'll wait about 60 seconds to, uh, while you're typing them in, we, um, we'll send you a survey. We'd like you to take the time to fill out about the content and how we did as speakers. And we'll also send you a copy of our PowerPoint today so that you have it as a reference. 
I know that Lisa has some good material in there. We talked about some exercises. Um, okay, this is one question. Uh, it says, how do you decide if a patient needs PT versus chiropractic care? So I'll let Caitlin take that one. Sure. So when you when we have patients come to the back and neck pain center, we do a really thorough assessment of their current condition, any prior treatment that they may have had in the past, and we make sure to customize the treatment option, you know, based on what they present with. So if somebody's coming and they have a lot of weakness, um, any kind of atrophy of their muscles, you know, in that situation, something like physical therapy might be an appropriate care, um, you know, treatment path for them. Whereas if somebody comes in um, who would benefit from something like traction therapy or a Cox table, just depending on what your presentation is, we might recommend chiropractic treatment. So it's very individualized and we really try to customize what we do treatment-wise based on your symptoms. Um, so there are some factors that would make you possibly uh, benefit more from one treatment um, measure versus the other, but that would be highly individualized. And I'll add that some patients do really well with physical therapy and some patients do really well with chiropractic care. So a lot of times what we do here is the patient's been going to physical therapy or a chiropractor initially and they plateau or they're just not responding the way we like, we'll oftentimes switch the mode of care to the other one to see if that works better. Um, Lisa, do you have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I think both of them have their own... Um, benefits, but uh, I know a couple of times we have also had patients do both and they actually did really well together, um, you know, for their obvious reasons, but um, we've worked together. I've collaborated with Dr. Ben with a few patients and they've done well. So sometimes both might even benefit you. That's a good point. Any other questions? We'll wait another few seconds. We have one more. Um, somebody was okay. asking about vitamins for anti-inflammation. Kayla? Right. So we don't have any specific recommendations. You know, I don't want to make any recommendations for vitamin supplementation. There are certainly things that can be supplements that would help with inflammation. Things like turmeric um, is very good for anti-inflammatory properties. So that's a spice that also comes in a supplement form. Um, but typically what we would do is we would look to make sure that there are no deficiencies in, in your vitamin levels that could cause problems with your pain. So that's something that we would assess um, and potentially get blood work done to see if supplementation would be necessary or beneficial to you um, with your care. You know, I think Caitlin really talked a lot about the role of diet and proper nutrition so that sometimes supplements really aren't necessary. If you're taking a look at Mediterranean diet and you're looking at the types of foods that are pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory, a lot of times that does the trick. Um, so diet and nutrition plays a large role in preventing inflammation and actually mitigating inflammation. Any other Great. questions? It uh, looks like we're wrapping that up right now. Um, if anybody does have any questions, like Dr. Ben said, feel free to write them to the email on your screen and we can definitely have somebody get back to you. Uh, in the meantime, like he said, please fill out the survey that you'll get. We really appreciate your feedback and thank you so much everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Ben, Caitlin, and Lisa. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.